have ever been to a monastery? No? Who has? Oh, you have. Oh, in Mexico. Okay, well, they're pretty much the same no matter where you go. I had the uh, privilege of surveying one when I was like 14, 15 years old. And I found out that they're very stringent, very strict, very much like military. You do things on a daily basis, and you do them over and over and over again. Well, in this one monastery, there was an abbot who called a novice. That's like, for a Southern Baptist, that's like a preacher boy. But he called a novice into his office and, and instructed him to give the homily, the, the uh, devotion, for the next day at chapel. So this novice was struck with fear. I mean, you can imagine what's going through his mind. The next morning, chapel came, and a few of his brothers were in the audience waiting to hear what he had to say. And as he stood up in the pulpit, his hands were trembling, his knees were knocking, his voice was quivering. And after a long pause, he began to speak. And he said, brothers, do you know what I'm going to say this morning? And they all shook their heads no, almost in unison, kind of like, like a choreograph. And he said, neither do I. Let's stand for the benediction. <laughs> well, the next day came, and more of his brothers were there. And he stood in the pulpit, and his knees were knocking, and his voice were quivering, and his hands were shaking. And he said, do you know what I'm going to say this morning? Well, because of the previous day, most of them then shook their head yes. He said, well, if you know what I'm going to say, tell your brother, let's stand for the benediction. Well, the abbot was very upset. He called him into the office and said, you know, I'm going to give you one more chance. If you do the same thing tomorrow, I'm going to put you on bread and water for 30 days. I'm going to put you in solitary confinement. Well, the next day came. And he stood in the pulpit, and his hands sweat, his voice quivered. His knees knocked, but the place was full because they kind of anticipated what was going to happen. And he said, you know what I'm going to say this morning? Well, half of them said yes. Half of them said no. And he said, well, those who know, tell the other half, let's send for the benediction. You see, when it comes to sharing our faith, sometimes we're the same way, don't we? We're like that novice in the monastery. We're kind of struck with fear. Even though the people that we're talking to are friends, relatives, neighbors, in most cases we've known them for years. We just don't go out on the street corner and preach, do we? But we're struck with fear. Our knees knock, our voices quiver, our hands sweat. Let me ask you, does that describe you? I bet if we took a survey, most people in this room, that would describe. Because we're kind of afraid to, to share our faith. And why is that? Well, mostly because of rejection. <laughs> Us. We don't like to be rejected. I don't like it. Well, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, if you would, this morning. We're going to see in this passage of Scripture how God will show us how to introduce people to his son Jesus. And I think that's kind of neat. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 4 and 5, are we up yet? What happened? There we go. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4. Whoop, that's the wrong one. <laughs> I 
I don't want that Idori, folks, but. Okay, here we go. Now we're on set. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Did you hear that? You guys are chosen and precious. Amen. Yes, we are. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as like a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. God is building a spiritual house, not with bricks, not with mortar, but with living stones, you and me. Amen. We are his living stones, with people like you and me who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you want to overcome your fear to introduce people to Jesus, you first need to know, whoops, let me do it. You need to know that you are a part of a holy temple. In fact, you are the holy temple. Because God said in verses 2 and 3 or two, 4 through 5 that he has chosen you to be precious. We need to understand that together, not just a separate pastor or the deacons or the elders of a church, but together. We are building, as believers, we are building that temple for God. And it's going to be a magnificent cathedral designed to, to give God the glory. And you know who's the cornerstone? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the foundation on which we are building that temple. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, it says, for it stands, in, it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling of a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. Those who refuse the Lord Jesus Christ are destined to stumble over, over him. And that's a shame. Because so many people that we love, so many people that, that are part of our family, our our, our work, our, our general life every day are going to go to hell because you and I don't have the, the gumption, the courage to tell them about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you this, folks. Believe it or not, but it's biblical. We're going to stand before God and he's going to hold us accountable for that. And that scares me to death. I don't know about you but it scares me to death. You see, the literal meaning of, of that word persuade is to disobey. And when God told us to go and we don't go, we're disobeying him. And that's very, very important. We have been chosen by him to help build that wonderful cathedral and the foundation of that cathedral is our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it was interesting. When they were building the, the temple, way back when, the temple site was supposed to be as quiet as possible, so they, they didn't cut the stones at that site. They cut them off-site. And that meant that these stone masons had to make their measurements precise. That they had to cut the stones perfectly when they, when they brought them in so they would just fit together. If you've ever seen the, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, there's not a piece of mortar in it. They're just stone laid after stone on top of each other, and they fit perfectly. That's the only part of the temple that's still left. And the Jews will go there and they'll pray and, 
it's interesting to watch these men because they, they just sway back and forth and they, they write their prayers out on a piece of paper and they put them in the cracks. And that whole wall is full of pieces of paper of, of prayers of the people. But there's not a piece of mortar in that building. Those stones are just fit together. But then they brought this one weird-shaped stone they didn't know what to do with. It was humongous. It was huge. But the Lord instructed them to bring that foundation, and that ended up being the cornerstone. And without that cornerstone being set into place, none of the other stones would be holding that building up, that wall up today that's, that's left in the temple. You see, Jesus is our cornerstone. He's the one that gives us stability in life. He's the one that gives us direction in life. Only if you depend on him. And I think that's the secret. We need to depend on him. He is the cornerstone. And the rest of us, we are the foundation of which he is building his kingdom. And that's so very, very important. God is doing this for one purpose and one purpose alone. He's building up his spiritual house so that you and I can offer spiritual sacrifices. Do you know what those are? Those are the people that we bring to the Lord. I've never thought of that before, but that's, that's true. When you lead a person to the Lord, you are responsible for that person. I've been in churches where, where they have brought literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people to the Lord each year. It was almost like a revolving door. They would come in, they'd get them saved, get them baptized, they'd spend a few weeks, maybe a month or two, and then they'd leave. Do you know why? because they were never meant to. But as the person that leads them to the Lord, we are their spiritual parent. It is our responsibility to mentor that person. That's how we lay the foundation of building that building for Jesus. That's so very, very important. I love what Hebrews 13 says. Whoops, did I miss one? I did. On this rock, I will build my church. Okay, we talked about that. I love what Hebrews 13 says. It says, through Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that is knowledge is acknowledging his name. And do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Your deeds, your words, when offered up, are sacrifices which are acceptable to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's so very, very important. Our very bodies are holy temples. And some of you will say, well, Pierce, you've got a big holy temple. <laughs> well, the truth is, we are his holy temples. Romans 12 says, whoops, let me get it back. Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. How many of you have ever done that? You said, God, here I am. Use me. Use me. Use me for whatever purpose you will have me to do. But, Pastor, I can't do that. I'm still raising my family. But, Pastor, I can't do that. I just retired and I want to have fun. But, Pastor, that golf course is out there and you know, I'm getting better. We all have excuses. I have excuses. God called me into ministry in 1972. And I said, God, I can't do that. I want to build a business. 
and he let me do that. But then in 1994, when I was 50 years old, I've shared this with you before, he called me again on I-94 at US-27. I'll never forget, speaking to my heart, I'm there in a stoplight. And he said, dummy, what are you doing? And I looked in my car, I didn't thought somebody else was in there. And he's talking to me. What are you doing? I went home that night. I had another 100 miles to go almost, and that just kept on my mind. And I went home, and Ruth and I prayed. And the next day, I got my employees together, and we decided to sell them the business. And within two weeks, we were off the seminary. I was 50 years old. You can't <laughs> pierce your nuts. Folks, when God calls you to do something, do it. We are the living sacrifices that he is creating. Paul says in, 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 in Romans chapter 15, because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister to Jesus Christ, to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sacrificed by the Holy Spirit. Your words, your deeds, your body, and the people who come to Christ in faith through your witness. These are the kind of sacrifices God wants. And oh, how we have failed him. Oh, how we have failed him. That's why he's building all of us together into his temple. One person can't do it. One person can't do it. But together, there's strength, isn't there? There's much strength. Back in 2017, in December, a man by the name of David Lang was living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was part of the music program for the public school system, and he realized that the federal government had cut the funds to the music program. All of their musical instruments were in disarray. In fact, they didn't work. So he wrote a symphony called the Symphony of the Broken Orchestra. And he got 400 people together. Some of them were kids, some of them were adults, some of them were professional musicians, and they each brought an instrument that they played. There was a cello there with one string, a violin with just pegs and no string, an oboe that the mouthpiece kept falling out of. 400 of these people came together. And they practiced, and they practiced, and they practiced. And when they started playing their music, it sounded terrible. Because the instruments just didn't work properly. But when they came together, even though the violin had no strings, but it had the pegs, and the lady would, would turn the peg to the tune of the music, the clarinet that had some valves and I don't know what you call those things on top, the, whatever those things are that your fingers go on. You know, like that? Keys, thank you. I never played the clarinet. I play the spoons. <laughs> hey, now, wait a minute. Down in Kentucky, that's okay. Yeah. But he had to put his fingers over the holes because there weren't any keys there. And when they came together, it was beautiful music. And then they faded out one by one by one by one until there was a clarinet left playing. And you know what a squeaky sound of a clarinet makes? It's terrible. My daughter started playing a clarinet once. Oh, I told Ruth to take her out of the house, put her in the garage. It was terrible. 
But you know what? Like that symphony of broken instruments, that's the church. That's you and me. We've all been broken, folks. And when we come together, we can make beautiful music. Peter uses the metaphor of one ugly stone, the cornerstone. <laughs> That's the corner of us. We can't forget that. So if you want to inter, uh, lose your fear of introducing people to Jesus, know that you are part of this holy temple. Then know that you are one of God's special people. Understand that you're not just a part, you are a part of the temple. You belong to a holy nation. Folks, you are different. The Bible says you are peculiar. Ruth told me not to do this, but you are peculiar. First Peter 2, chapter uh, verse 9 and 10 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a royal holy nation, a people for his known, uh, of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, the Israelites were God's chosen people in the Old Testament, weren't they? Well, what happened? They've forgotten God. Listen to what Exodus 19 says in verses 5 and 6. You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be, be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That was to the Jews. Again in Hosea chapter 2, I will sow her for myself in a land, and I have, will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And in Isaiah 43, I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself that they might declare my praise. The Israelites were special in the Old Testament. They were gathered together to, to influence, to be an influence. But what happened? They didn't do it. They became part of this godless nation that they, they went into. They uh, took over their customs. They forgot who they were. Instead of seeing themselves as God's special people, they limited themselves by being a part of the world. They blended in. They lost their influence. And today, Israel has no temple or priesthood. Now, God's going to restore them. We're told that in, in Romans chapter 11, and I believe that with all my heart. God will restore that. But in the meantime, he calls us, you and me, to be a special people. Folks, don't ever forget who you are. You are a royal priesthood. Oh, praise God. You are royalty. Back in 2019, there was a black man in Philadelphia I'm sorry, Rockford, Maryland. Maryland. I got Philadelphia in my, on my mind. We're going to have cheesesteaks for lunch. <laughs> Don't laugh if you've never had a Philadelphia cheesesteak. They're good. Anyhow, Mr. James Sprakes was doing some research on his genealogy, and he realized that he was a prince in a small African nation called Benin. Whoops, let me go back. Oh, that didn't show up on it. I had a little arrow there. Benin, even though he grew up in New Jersey, didn't drive a car, or didn't have much money, so he decided that he'd make contact with the people in Benin. He got on an airplane and he 
flew over there, and as he was landing, he realized that there on the tarmac where the plane was, well, it looked like the whole country showed up. Bands were playing, people were marching, cheerleaders were out there. And he wondered, what's this for? And he finally realized, <laughs> it's for me. <laughs> now, he wasn't really a prince. He couldn't, he couldn't do any princely things. So you know what they did? They sent him to prince school to learn how to be a prince. He said, you know, to know about yourself, about your heritage, is overpowering. Overpowering. Do you know what your heritage is? You are a royal priesthood, Donna. You are a princess. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? Andrew, you're a prince. Now, Joe might not say that, but, but that's okay. You are a chosen race, folks. A royal priesthood, a royal nation, a people in God's or his own possession. In other words, you are royalty. I'm not going to bow down to you because I bow down to Jesus. Amen. But as royalty, we all need to bow down to him, don't we? Amen. Now, your neighbors might not suspect your royalty. <laughs> but you know what? They should. They should. They should realize you're different. A little bit of peculiar. Different, weird. You see, don't forget like Israel did. God has chosen you. God has chosen you. And that's so very, very important. And then lastly, we are to be witnesses God has called. We are to be his witnesses. In verses 11 and 12, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conflict among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. How do you influence people? Well, every one of you should go out on the street corner this afternoon and just take the soapbox off with you and just stand on it and start preaching, right? No. You go to work tomorrow, and you'd be different. You'd be different. You show them Jesus Christ within you. That's how we're different. When they speak something unkind to you, you turn the other cheek. Now, that's kind of hard sometimes, isn't it? It is for me. I just want to punch them out. In love, of course. But the fact is, we need to put our human nature away because we're not human. We're royalty, folks. You're royalty. And they're watching us. They're watching us, hoping that we'll make a mistake. And we will. That's when we learn two words. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. God wants us to be like Jesus Christ. So you need to realize, folks, you are a part of a holy temple. You belong to God. He has chosen you. You are a royal priesthood. We need to live that. I'm going to go out tomorrow from Amazon and get me a crown. <laughs> Not really. So, listen to me. If you want to overcome your fear of introducing people to Jesus, know that you're a part of the Holy Family. That's so very, very important. Then know that you're a part of the Holy Temple. You are one of God's special people. And then lastly, you need to know who you are. Be the witness God has called you to be. Ask him for strength. Start out small by just telling a neighbor, you know, 
God loves you, Fred, and so do I. That's so easy. You don't have to preach to them. You just have to be kind and show Jesus Christ through you. Would you pray with me? Father, what a blessing it is to know that we are royalty. You have chosen us. God, thank you. Help us not to forget who we are in you. Help us to have the courage to take those whom we love, whom we work with, who we, we care about deeply, and share the good news with them. God, all I'm asking for is that you would give us courage. Courage to first say, I care about you. How can I help you? Showing someone that Jesus Christ lives within us. Father, we love you. And we ask these things so that you and you alone might be glorified.